Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly. We normally send out a copy of our leaflet, Staying Healthy at Glenfield. I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of £6.50. OK. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory, and if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't in fact register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street, but I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the North Campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever, really. They can even arrange financial help. Mm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is 0900 762 5913. I'll say it again. 0900 762 5913. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the South Campus in the Sports Centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of £22 to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S-O-N-Y... Uh, no. I'll spell it. S O N. I A, then or is O R R. Or. Okay. And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's G F. 23-9-B-Q. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... 
I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post and you should get it soon. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers' Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the Secretary of the Students' Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here. But once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you. Throughout the week from Monday to Friday, Every morning, starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at 5 o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum, as well as the popular Ghost Walk. You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. Also in this building is the Trade Fair on Wednesday, from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed. So come along to Blackmore Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment.
That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7:30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers Opening Ceremony, when the dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, Thursday the 18th from 2:30 to 3:30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. At the end of the week on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair. So we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from nine in the evening to three o'clock in the morning. Right, I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week. So remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. Now listen and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e., try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules, and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback. You know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So, how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version. Yeah. Then we sent it to the forty students by email and got twenty-eight replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care, but I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So, what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words. Which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No, okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory, so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So, how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? 
There were lots of similarities, but、uh... there were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said. They'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision, and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming.、Oh, yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were, and that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely, we got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project. I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. By choosing the best answers from the choices. Good morning, everybody. We'll continue to look at Australia, and today look at one of its greatest natural challenges: water for the agricultural sector. As the only nation to occupy an entire continent, Australia has a unique environment, with much of it very flat and dry. One notable feature of the Australian continent is that it is the lowest of the continents. The average elevation is less than 300 meters, compared with the world's mean of 700 meters, and its highest mountain is only 2,228 meters. So, it is overall a very flat country. It is also dry. In fact, Australia. Is the driest after Antarctica of the continents. Yet Australia has extremes of climate and topography. There are rainforests and vast plains in the north, snowfields in the southeast, deserts in the centre, and fertile croplands in the east, south, and southwest. And Australia contains some of the wettest areas on Earth. In Western Tasmania, and on the northern Queensland coast, but half of the continent has an annual rainfall of less than 300 millimeters each year, and only 20 percent has more than 600 millimeters each year. A major problem is that the limited water resources do not match up with where water is consumed. The major water resources are in northern Australia and Tasmania. Whereas most of the agriculture and people are in southeastern mainland Australia, the agricultural sector is the largest consumer of both self-extracted and main-supplied water, using over 70 percent of total net water consumption. Electricity and gas supply, and water, sewerage, and drainage services use notable amounts of self-extracted water. However, net consumption in the household sector is the lowest, just eight percent of total net water used. Australia's water use increased by twenty-five percent over the decade between the mid nineteen eighties and mid nineteen nineties. Much of this increase was due to irrigated agriculture, which, as noted earlier, accounts for over seventy percent. Of national water demand, since the mid 1990s, the growth and profitability of irrigated agriculture 
has outstripped the dry land agriculture sector. Irrigated commodities contributed almost a third of total farm exports in the mid 1990s. The results of a special government report in 2000 showed that if today's water use arrangements continue, the water needs of the rural industries will outstrip water availability by about 2020. Irrigated agriculture, Australia's major water using sector, would be seriously affected by the shortwall. And although groundwater underlies large areas of Australia, it accounts for only 4% of water use. So, clearly, apart from water for households, which mainly comes from dams or rivers, it is the rural sector where efforts towards water conservation. Are particularly directed. In this sector, the largest consumers of water are the meat and wool industries. One of the major problems in considering sustainable agriculture is the large amount of irrigated water used to produce these products. Some of the crops, such as wheat, maize, and soybeans, also use a lot of water. Furthermore, Many crops are grown in dry areas, where up to half the available water evaporates from the soil surface or seeps down too low into the ground for the plant roots to reach it. Well, that's all we have time for this morning. You will be able to do further study on this topic in the library, and I have a handout here with references for those who want to come out to the front to collect it. Next week, we'll look at outback farming, and you now have half a minute to check your answers.